Jets travel to Indy looking for their first victory. 0-2. They need it. Against a good Colts team, it is Lawrence Cager time, and we discuss what the Jets have to do to match up with Indy. Sabo Radio on the eve of week three Sunday, in which the Jets, the 0-2 Jets, the talentless, according to many people, uh, no good coached Jets, head to Indy. Well, they're in Indy right now, I believe, waiting for their 4 o'clock game, 4.05 to be exact, Eastern Standard Time, against the Colts at Lucas Oil Stadium. Sunday, and this Colts team is legit. It's a really good team, and the Jets come in banged up, really banged up. In fact, they'll have only four wide receivers dressed, the same amount of quarterbacks they'll have dressed. Berrios, Hogan, Josh Malone, and Lawrence Cager, who was elevated from the practice squad today, Saturday. It's finally cager time, and the Jets need him to step up with Perryman out. And that was the thing with Perryman. Robbie Anderson still tearing it up. Um, ter- well, I shouldn't say still. His first two games with Carolina, incredible under Matt Rule. Panthers are 0-2 with Teddy Bridgewater. So Joe Douglas is taking a lot of egg on the face right now with the Robbie Anderson performance. I will also take egg on my face if it continues. What I said at the time was Perryman has a higher ceiling, but he's not as reliable. His injury history is incredible. So that was always the concern. Robbie Anderson is more reliable. He never, I shouldn't say never, rarely misses games due to injury. Perryman, on the other hand, you know, he could do stuff Robbie Anderson can't do. Go up, get it at the high point. Uh, Play the sideline game, toe tap, all that good stuff. But reliability is number one. So right now, Joe Douglas, that's a miss, a major miss. It's only two weeks into the season. You know, everyone likes to freak out after one week. Two weeks, uh, people are pretending it's a a decade of play. We got to let it play out, see what happens. But Perryman being hurt is a killer with Denzel Mims on IR. Uh, They can get Mims back next week if he's ready. I believe that would be three weeks on IR, but he's got to be ready. You know, he's injured both hamstrings now this year. Jets fans are already getting Stephen Hill vibes from the guy because of the injuries. Not the talent, but because of the injuries and because of the second round pick. The key for this offense, for Darnold, with the weapons, which I think is an overrated topic. It matters, but I think it's overrated. The key is having one of those big guys, Mims or Perryman. You can't trot out Berrios, Crowder, and Hogan. That doesn't mesh. That doesn't mix well. Two slot guys and Hogan who, you know, let's be honest, is neither a slot guy nor an outside threat. You know, he's kind of a tweener in that regard. New England used him in that regard as well. In the slot often. Uh, on the outside often, depending on the look, depending on the personnel where, and where Edelman and Amendola played. Um, Cager, he is going to be asked to be that outside threat for Darnold this Sunday. Will he start right away? Based on the way this coaching staff works, I would guess no. It takes a hell of a lot for this coaching staff to, to come up with a surprise start. You never see surprise starts. You never see uh, any surprises. Everything, If anything, everything is easing guys back in, making it easy on them, never challenging them. Uh, Avery Williamson, perfect example. Last week, man played 15 snaps, I believe, while Alec Ogletree was running a, a 6 5 it looked like, especially on that first 80-yard run to Mostert. I'd be shocked if Williamson doesn't start this Sunday based on that performance, based on what they saw Monday in the film room. But that's a perfect example. You know, if if Cager has the offense down, just to a decent degree where he could pass, not expert level, 
but to where he can pass on the field and he knows what he's doing, he's starting on my offense. Darnold needs that big outside threat. This guy is 6'5", 220. Start him, Berrios, and Crowder. Boom. That's your 11 personnel and have Hogan as the fourth guy. You can't keep this guy, dress him, and keep him on the sideline. But Saturday, the Jets activated, uh, well, call it elevated, Cager and Jimmy Murray, the interior offensive lineman, as the two practice squad guys, they will elevate for week three to make their roster from 53 to 55 as per the COVID 2020 guidelines. Uh, Josh Malone was activated, elevated the first two weeks. You can't elevate a guy more than two weeks in any season, which is a, I think it's a decent rule for the NFL trying to promote uh, more guys, give, give everybody a chance on the expanded practice squad, which is 16 players, enormous and flexible because you could put veterans on there as well. Um, so because they need Malone, they signed him to get him on, on the 53 man roster. Um, and previously I said Crowder, Berrios, Hogan, obviously Crowder's out for this game. It's Malone, Berrios, Hogan, Cager. So whether Malone or Hogan on the sideline, if I was coaching this team, Cager would be out there. Give me Cager, Berrios, and Hogan. Those three. Crowder. I think I uh, went with too much positivity there, thinking Crowder was back. But Crowder, as you know, Crowder, Perryman, Mims, (laughs) their three starting receivers coming into the season, all out due to injury. So it's Cager time. Jimmy Murray's activated. Why? Because Connor McGovern is questionable. With the hamstring, like the 81 other players on the injury report who have hamstring injuries. And we already know Fant is going to miss the game. So Adoga will start at right tackle. It remains to be seen whether that's an issue. Um, If McGovern can't go, and McGovern did participate in individuals, in positionals Friday, if I'm not mistaken. I wasn't there Friday. I was there Thursday and Wednesday. He and Gase on Wednesday said McGovern's trying to weasel his way out to practice, but he didn't practice Wednesday. They held him out. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if he does play or doesn't play. It'll be a game time decision. If I had to bet on it, I would say he doesn't play because this coaching staff just doesn't play guys who are hurt. And it's amazing that they're that cautious with these guys and the injury report looks the way it looks. It's just stunning. It's it's one of the greater mysteries um, in football today. You know, you see the practice. These guys are stretching. They're doing their dynamic. It's not like the old days where teams would get into a circle. There'd be a guy, one, two, or three guys in the middle of the circle, and they're doing stationary stretches. You know, feet shoulder width apart, bend down, uh, stretch the hammy. It's all dynamic now. You you go from sideline to sideline or sideline to middle of the field and and you move and stretch at the same time. And that's the preferred way pretty much every football team goes now. Jets don't do anything different from any other football team. So how and why this is happening, we won't have an answer. And it's got to be the most frustrating thing in the world for Jets fans. Here's the injury report, the full injury report. It looks like an entire team. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 guys on the Jets injury report. Final injury report of the week. Crowder, as I said, mistakenly said he was playing. Obviously, he's not. Crowder, Ashton Davis, that's another one we haven't touched on. He's out, groin, Crowder hamstring, Fant concussion, uh, Perryman ankle, uh, he got hurt blocking on the screen last week, and Quincy Wilson concussion all out. Barrios, McGovern, Nate Hairston, all questionable. Barrios, McGovern with hamstrings, Hairston with a hip. The Jets are dressing just four receivers, and Barrios is questionable. 
What if he can't go? Do you only have three? Odds are he will go. Will he play? Will, will he be the fourth guy? And will we see Cager, Malone, Hogan? Who knows? But it's amazing. Four receivers, four quarterbacks. Flacco is back. Uh, he looks like he will be the backup. Other guys who are on the injury report but were full practice on Friday include Josh Andrews, who's slated to play center if McGovern doesn't go. Kalen Balaj, Becton, shoulder. Becton ever, were to ever get hurt, that would be, I mean, much more trouble than what they find themselves in right now. Flacco, we just talked about. Frank Gore was not injury-related. McClendon was not injury-related. Chris Hogan, Rib, another receiver. Holy cow. Harvey Lange, LaMichael Perrine, who, if the Jets really want to get the offense going, Perrine has to get more than a few carries. Get this kid involved. Frank Gore missed a lot of holes last week. Against San Fran, the Jets O-line did a tremendous job, and especially on first down. They ran the ball for over five yards. As we touched on in the last show, they failed on second down, and Gase lowered the offensive line's production by forcing runs in second and manageable, second and short, third and short. Get Perrine involved. He has to be at least 50-50 with Gore. Stop with the easing everybody in. Take a shot. Avery Williamson, hamstring, final guy. For the Colts, uh, two guys out right now. They're relatively healthy, which is something Jets fans don't know existed. Matthew Adams, linebacker, ankle out, and Rock Yasin, the corner, the young corner, Temple, Questionable, uh, tight end Jack Doyle did fully practice on Friday. So I, I think unless I miss something, he should be going. DeForest Buckner, huge acquisition from San Fran, did not practice on Friday, but nothing listed for game status. Uh, he's listed with a back. Anthony Costanzo just rested. Hilton rested. And Justin Houston, the veteran, also rested on Friday. And the final one, safety, Julian Blackman, knee limited practice on Friday. Nothing listed for game status. So the struggling, depressed, 0-2 injury-riddled Jets look for the first win of the season against the 1-1, could easily be 2-0, relatively healthy, free Indianapolis Colts who are loaded with talent. Quick look at their depth chart. Uh, Hilton, Pittman, Pascal out wide. They got plenty of weapons. Doyle, we just touched on with the injury report. The strength of the team is the offensive line. You know, when Andrew Luck was there and he pulled some rabbits out of a hat in the playoffs in January, the organization got ahead of itself. They they made they went with a couple horrible signings. Gore, Andre Johnson, these veteran signings where it wasn't the right way to go. They needed offensive line talent and Luck fooled them completely fooled them into thinking they were ready for prime time when they weren't. Long story short, Luck nearly gets destroyed because of terrible O-lines after that. They finally do it the right way, hire the right GM, do it the right way, get the O-line built, and slowly but surely, once the point, that point started of offensive line coming together as one of the best units in the league, everything gets built on after that. And look where they are now. I think they will win this division. Yeah, they got to contend with the Titans. I think the Titans are really good. I like Vrabel, but I think they will win this division. I think they're that good. Um, and with Phillip Rivers, hey, why not? Marlon Mack got hurt first week. Jonathan Taylor, the rookie, uh, they haven't missed a beat. Their offense is doing well. I think they're top 10 in rushing and passing, if I'm not mistaken. We'll check that out in a bit. Defensively, they added DeForest Buckner. So their pass rush is doing pretty pretty well. I think they're top five in sacks. Again, we'll check that in a second. Uh, linebackers, of course, Darius Leonard. Anthony Walker, the fifth-round pick, playing the mic. It's a 4-3 team. And it's a really a two-deep Tampa 2 team. Um, Julian Blackman. Willis at safety, two young guys. Kenny Moore, 
from New England at corner and Xavier Rhodes, another acquisition at corner. A solid defense. I wouldn't say it's tremendous. Uh, it's a cover two, a lot of Tampa two. So they lo- they play a lot of two deep uh, with this defensive coordinator, Matt. I, I always forget how to pronounce his name. Eberflus, Matt Eberflus, E-B-E-R-F, as in Frank, L-U-S, who was in the college ranks, got his start with uh, Eric Mangini and Rob Ryan with the Cleveland Browns uh, during the time Rex was here in New Jersey. Then he followed Rob Ryan to Dallas, where he crossed paths with uh, Kiffin, Monty Kiffin. And that's really where his cover two, Tampa two, Influence started to take hold. Obviously, with any Tampa 2 DC these days, they'll play a lot of cover three as well. You know, starting too deep, dropping one down, buzzing, sky, whatever you want to do. Uh, But they like to play too deep. So what do the Jets have to do offensively? Run the ball? Yes. Uh, Can they run the ball? I don't know. I mean, they ran it well against San Francisco last year, which is a really, uh, last year, last week, which is a really promising thing. Behind Makai Becton would be the better bet. Run it behind that big guy because he's he's looking like a Pro Bowl left tackle right now. But here's what might scare Gase and why Gase can't be scared by this. The Colts are the number five run defense team in the league right now. 171, 171 yards over two games. What he did against San Fran last last week was game plan such a conservative way because he was scared of the San Fran pass rush. So he ran it to a fault, asked his offense to play perfect, and it, you know, cut the game drastically in terms of time, in terms of plays. You just can't play that way in today's league. You could game plan that way, but you have to adjust in game. And I don't think he'll do that against the Colts. But stats like this is what scares him into potentially doing that. He can't do that against the Colts. Now, again, another stat that might scare him is the Colts right now in the passing game defensively. Number one in the league, 245 yards per game defensively. Giants are number two, 377. This Colts defense right now is not as good as these stats. Adam Gase offensively, and this has to be the game plan. Sure, run it. Try to establish the run. That's fine. But the Colts defense, Eberflus, like any defensive coordinator, even if he's a Tampa 2 guy, will challenge this Jets offense. He will play aggressively, He will challenge the receivers to beat his corners one-on-one. And with their corners right now, Rhodes, I respect Rhodes. Uh, Kenny Moore, you know, he's okay. They're going to play press, even even in single high. And they'll go too deep as well. But they will challenge these receivers. Gase has to, has to allow Darnold to take what the defense has given him. And if, he's, and if they're giving him one-on-one opportunities down the sideline, Gase has to allow Darnold to take those shots early. And I'm talking first series, second series. On the road, I know it's not a crowd situation, but on the road, an injury-riddled team reeling, you have to allow the quarterback to take those chances early, which will loosen up the D and allow Gore and Perrine and Becton in the offensive line to do its thing. McGovern's presence obviously is a big deal too. So offensively, it's simple. It's more about the Jets right now than it is the defense. Allow Darnold freedom at the line. Take what the defense gives you. Don't be afraid to attack. Every defense is going to get in your face, get in your weapons face because they don't respect the weapons. So make them pay. Defensively, Greg Williams, I think it's simple. Yeah, your corners aren't great. We know this. Bless Austin, Desir, uh, Quincy Wilson. Was he out or was he questionable? I already forget. Uh, Harrison's on there too. Harrison's questionable. Quincy Wilson's out with the concussion. Corners aren't great. 
but their receivers are pretty solid. You still have to challenge Phillip Rivers. As good as Phillip Rivers is, he's got probably the weakest arm in the league. Him and Ryan Fitzpatrick are neck and neck. You have to challenge this guy to go 20 plus yards downfield. Jonathan Taylor, great offensive line. I want to see Marcus May in the box early on nearly every play other than third and long, obvious passing situations. Hey, if Rivers beats you in those aggressive looks, you tip your cap, you adjust, and you go from there. But force the offense's hand. Try to make Rivers beat you downfield. And I think that's that's the way the Jets should play it against this team. It's a really talented team. Um, I don't know. I'm still on the fence with the points the Jets are getting. I'm still on the fence either way. Uh, Jonathan Taylor, you know, Hell of a nice looking running back. And for all the fantasy players who drafted Taylor, you got lucky with Marlon Mack going down so early. Um, In fact, I had Mack. And if you're looking on YouTube right now, uh, you know, the Colts beat Minnesota, I believe 2011, spanked them last week. Minnesota is also a struggling team. Look at the Colts defense. This is the way they love to play it. Two deep, first play of the game, first and 10, two deep, four, three, against 12 personnel with the corners hard. They love the aggressive corners. That's why Greg Williams liked to see her because Greg Williams also likes aggressive corners. Greg Williams uses Tampa two principles, but he's also very aggressive in terms of blitzing and pressure and all that stuff. So he likes the aggressive corner who could tackle. And so do the Colts. So too deep on the first play. Um, you know, where a lot of teams won't go too deep on the first play. They'll go single high and and see what uh, the offense does because very rarely will the offense dial up a, a deep one or a big chunk shot down the field. Second play, they go single high with an aggressive look, and this is what the Jets will see. No matter how much the Colts love that too deep Tampa 2, this is what the Jets will see. Uh, after they get the first down, first and 10, uh, another too deep situation. There they are. Press. More motion from Minnesota out of the 12 personnel. And another play action bootleg. Was that three in a row? Might have been. I'm not going back to check it out. But second down. Let's see what the Colts D does here. More of an aggressive look. Again, hard corners. Without digs. They're not really respecting the Minnesota weapons. And I think offensive coordinators overthink it too much. When you see that look, allow your offense to attack. It's not like the old days where it's a risky play. Third and five, too deep. Now this is third and five. Yes, Minnesota's empty, but the play call was too deep and see the safety drop down. Um, Looks like a, looked like a, man situation with uh, safety robbing down and uh, the other safety uh, going one deep in man. But Minnesota gets the ball. This this is what you'll see. You'll see a lot of two deep. You'll see the Colts want to go to a lot of two deep, excuse me. But you'll see everything else really aggressive. No respect for the corners. Trying to shut down the Jets run game and get Darnold into passing situations in which he uh, is staring at the rush. Offensively for the Colts, you know, it's Jonathan Taylor. It's the offensive line. Got to stop that first. You know, Frank Reich comes from Peterson, Reed, Philly. Zone rush scheme, likes the zone, runs counters with Taylor as well. Um, Always throws a couple wrinkles in there for each matchup. On the screen here, you'll see Rivers. It looks like a design swing to uh, Taylor to open it up. Yep. Design swing, screen, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Paris Campbell, the youngster. What is it, second year? Second or third year? Ohio State, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Jet sweep to him. Uh, Again, I mean, that, that killed the edge. And expect jet sweep. Oh, did Campbell get hurt there? Yeah, it looks like he got hurt. But, uh... 
Expect a lot of edge stuff from Reich, a lot of outside zones, a lot of jet sweeps because of the Jets' terrible edge play, slow edge play with Jordan Jenkins, Henry Anderson. Henry Anderson shouldn't be out there. I feel bad for Henry Anderson. He should be on the inside. He's a 300-pound man. And him out there against the Niners last week, you saw it on the first play. Uh, Shanahan attacked to that edge. Moster, 80-yard touchdown. Quincy Wilson did not do a good job setting the edge from a uh, DB perspective. Uh, there goes Taylor for 13. Uh, looks like 12 personnel. Rivers does something at the line. Likes what he sees in terms of a run motion. So you got twin tight ends. And yes, just a mid zone, insider mid zone. Um, so Greg Williams, you'll have to sell out on the run. You'll have to sell out for the short passes because that's Rivers' game. And dare him to beat you deep and hope that he doesn't. But if he does, tip your cap, move on, adjust. The spread is 11 and a half. That's an absurd spread. Even money, pick them. You'd have to be a crazy person to pick the Jets over to Colts. You'd have to be Joaquin Phoenix, his character in The Joker, to pick Adam Gase's team right now. But with 11 and a half points, I'm taking the Jets. That's a lot of points. I know they're on the road. I know they're 0-2. I know they have no receivers. Injured. Gase can't sit down. No matter how many layers of clothes he has on, because his ass will get burned from the temperature. But 11 and a half, give me the Jets. If McGovern plays, I'd feel a lot better. A lot. But uh, 11 and a half, give me the Jets. Over under is 44. I would probably choose the over in this one, but I don't feel confident. Three other games, and we'll start it. We'll start it in week three. We didn't do it the first two weeks. I mentioned in our last podcast, we'll start doing it, picking three games each week. We'll pick the Jets game with the spread and then three games each week. Folks, do not take my gambling advice. I am not a gambler. I've played fantasy since the 90s, since I was a kid. You know, bet on a few games here and there. Suicide pools. I'm still, I'm still alive, thank God, after two weeks this year. But do not take my gambling advice. Please, do not do that. Taking the Jets, plus 11 and a half. Um, the other one, the first one of the three non-Jet games, Cardinals. I won with them last week in the suicide pool. They're 2-0. and Lions are 0-2, which scares me. You know, the third week, when, when teams are 2-0 and 0-2, and and there's a lot of desperation. Um, the line is, the spread is, Five and a half, which I don't think is a lot. I, I think it should be a lot more. I mean, Cardinals to the Lions is similar right now, you know, compared to the Colts to the Jets. One's five and a half, one's 11 and a half. Give me the Cardinals over the Lions, giving up the 5.5 at home. Number two game will be, I have a couple in my mind. Not sure exactly where I'm going to go. Oh, I know. Number two game is the LA Chargers. Again, a home favorite. Six and a half. Chargers are a good team. Played the Chiefs tough. Rough game. Bucker had to hit three field goals last week to win in overtime. It was almost a tie. These 10 minute overtimes, I'll tell you. It, it's pretty nuts because it gets down to the it gets down quick in overtime. A lot of ties which I don't hate, but I, I didn't see any need to really change it from 15 to 10, to be honest. Uh, 6.5, Chargers are given up to the Panthers. Again, another one that scares me, Chargers are 1-1, one one, Panthers 0-2. Panthers haven't played terribly, but they're, out, they're without McCaffrey. It's a killer. And Matt Rule still has a lot to prove. Give me the Chargers at home, 6.5. I see them running very well 
with both Eckler and Joshua Kelly this week. If you play daily fantasy, FanDuel DraftKings, if Eckler, I don't know his price, so I shouldn't say get him. Um, if his price is modest, grab Eckler this week. Uh, Kelly as well. Well, not as well, but if you don't go Eckler and you need that flex play, Joshua Kelly might be a nice sneaky pick. So that's number two. Number three, and this one is uh, a little ballsy. My brother is all over me for choosing the Patriots in the suicide pool. But I'm going with the Pats over the Raiders. Spread is six, which surprises me. It could be a sucker bet. I think the spread should be around four, three and a half. Uh, you know, three points is usually the home, the home spread counter. Without fans, it maybe should be a little different. Travel still at play. Six is a lot. And I don't like to take three home favorites, but I got to take the Patriots. Again, they're a good team. And that was a heartbreaker against Seattle in prime time last week. Raiders are flying high, just beating the Saints, who did not play well in Las Vegas' first game. So I could see a little letdown from the Raiders coming into Foxborough and Cam Newton and the Pats getting it done, winning, you know, by two scores. So we'll take the Jets with the points. With the points, I'm not a crazy person. With the points, 11 and a half. We'll take Arizona at home, giving up five and a half. We'll take the Chargers at home again. Giving up uh, six and a half. And we'll take the Patriots with our friend Bill Belichick up north, giving up six to Chucky's Raiders. And that's where we'll start the year in terms of these picks. Yeah, it's not perfect. We couldn't get it done, um, you know, week one, week two. A lot of stuff to do with Jets X Factor. I had to update the app. For everyone listening, if you use the app and if you had login troubles recently, that will be fixed with the most recent update that came out today. Today or yesterday. I think it might have been yesterday for Android, today for Apple, but whatever. Check the update. If you update, if you had login issues, it should be fixed with this update. Um, So we got that done. Blew it. This maniac... Joe Blewett put out a four, I think four hour, 20 minute film review on week two with the Jets. Animal. So if you have um, a decade of your life where you need to burn and you need something to do, check out Joe Blewett's uh, film review on YouTube. It's on Jets X Factor as well. Uh, Michael Nania. uh, What did he do? He did something recently, which was pretty damn good um oh he makes the argument that no matter how bad the coaching staff has been Darnold still should be evaluated and it's true social media makes every fan base look that much dumber uh there's no nuance and that's not just for fan bases that's everything in this world but with Darnold any one negative thing someone has to say about him eh, you get jumped on so it's just not good. You know, both two things could be true at once. Gase could be a poor coach and Darnold could simply not have it or Darnold could have lost it due to many circumstances. Gase, the O-line, what have you. So still evaluate Darnold. Don't give up on him completely, but don't think he's Montana ready to roll in the right circumstance either. There's a lot of nuance that needs to be to, needs to be done there. And uh, also, Ben Blessington, Nania's partner in crime on Cool Your Jets, um, made the argument that Arthur Smith, the Tennessee Titans offensive coordinator, is the perfect head coaching candidate for the Jets next year. Uh, look what he's done for Tannehill. Yes, they have a great O-line. Taylor Lewin up front, Derrick Henry. But um, Arthur Smith has been great. And Vrabel is a hell of a coach. But uh, week three, tomorrow, Jets 
Listen, this game might go a long way in telling us what kind of year it's going to be. Last year, they started 0-4, miraculously finished 7-9. Pretty easy, cupcake-like schedule. But it's, it's going to come down to Darnold. That's going to be the main topic. You know, the Gase conversation, it's pretty one-sided. Darnold, he will be entering his fourth year next year. As a first-rounder, he'll have a fifth-year option. That fifth-year option will be based on performance as per the new CBA. How that gets calculated is very detailed. It will be interesting to see if the Jets finish dead last in the league and they have the number one pick. Is picking Trevor Lawrence the bona fide only decision? Right now, Today, as we stand, I would say yes, you have to take him. Taking that kid on year one of a rookie deal with Joe Douglas trying to build that O-line, trying to build everything around him, is worlds ahead of Darnold entering year four in which you don't know what you have. And you have to extend the man and pay him big dollars when you don't know what you have. That's a salary cap disaster in the making. But I only say that right now. You know, if Darnold improves and and showcases what he is the rest of the way, things drastically change. And this is only if they have the first pick, which is highly, no matter how bad they are, highly unlikely at this point. Look at the Dolphins. Everyone thought the Dolphins were going to get the first pick last year uh, without question. Look what happened. So that'll be a topic that we will discuss soon. And it might be sooner rather than later, depending on what happens tomorrow. But hey, you, the Jets fan, you will be there watching it tomorrow, I think. We'll see. Some of you won't be. And you'll be hoping for a win, as the Jets will be as well. You know, 1-2 and is a lot different than 0-3. And And it's amazing what one week, one game can do in the NFL. And Adam Gase and the Jets are hoping that one week, that one game, happens in Indy on Sunday tomorrow. Until next time. 